Hi, everyone. Welcome back one last time to Matt AO2, The Magic of Numbers. You have made it to the end. This is the very last day of lecture. Um, and today we're going to finish off with an interactive exercise and then with some exam review. So um, let's go ahead and get started. So today we're going to be doing a hybrid crypto interactive. So what are we, uh, but before we get started, let's uh, go back and review a little bit of uh, the communication story that we've been telling for the last couple lectures. So we have Alice. Alice wants to talk to Bob. Um, and of course, so they want to send information back and forth. Um, but what they're worried about is they're worried about some eavesdropper, Eve. So this is the eavesdropper listening in. So Eve, the eavesdropper is going to try to listen in and see what Alice and Bob are saying to each other. Um, one way of solving this is, of course, for Alice and Bob to encrypt all of their communication, right? So that's what we did last time. Um, we talked about how to encrypt things. And we talked, of course, about asymmetric versus symmetric cryptography. So with symmetric cryptography, uh, so asymmetric and symmetric, um, asymmetric is also known as public key cryptography, which is what we covered in the last lecture. But for symmetric encryption, you use the same key for encryption and decryption. So this is nice. It uh, makes things uh, very nice and straightforward, so things like Caesar ciphers. But unfortunately, it means that if you know how to encrypt, you also know how to decrypt. On the other hand, asymmetric encryption is a little bit more like the sort of mailbox here, where anyone can send you mail, but only you can take it out. And so knowing how to encrypt mail and knowing how to encrypt doesn't let you know how to decrypt. And this is quite useful. Um, so symmetric encryption has the issue that's fast, but doesn't work if Eve is ever able to intercept the key. On the other hand, asymmetric encryption is slow because there's lots of math involved. So this involves modular square roots like we talked about uh, on Monday, but it's able to secure communication even if Eve hears everything because Eve only learns how to send messages to Alice and Bob, but not how to receive them, or no, sorry, but not how to read them, how to decrypt them. So there are a couple of examples, uh, examples of symmetric ciphers. Um, so for example, uh, the uh, Caesar cipher, which we covered, uh, as well as the Visionaire cipher. And I'm also introducing a new one here, which we're not going to cover in detail because this is much more advanced. So this is the American encryption standard, also known, uh, it used to be known as Rheindahl before it became the American encryption standard. And this is probably what your browsers are actually using. It's a lot more complicated, it has a lot more steps to it. But the basic idea is still something like the Caesar or Visionaire ciphers where you have a key and that allows you to encrypt and decrypt by doing some complicated operation to your data. Um, and of course, for asymmetric cryptography, we have the example of RSA, which is actually in use. In fact, I'll show you in a moment that it is actually used by our browsers today, as well as Elgamal, which is another alternative that you might see or hear if you uh, hang out in the crypto world for long enough. Okay, so that's the basic idea behind uh, the symmetric and asymmetric crypto that we did last time. But of course, these have issues, right? One of them is slow, but uh, has but allows you to communicate without um, ever having met the other person. The other is fast, but you need some way of communicating a password. Enter hybrid crypto systems. So why not use them both? And this is exactly what modern uh, browsers do. Uh, you get the best of both worlds by combining the two. So you use the slow public key cryptography, which really is quite slow, even for computers, it's quite slow. Um, then exchange a small message containing a key for the symmetric method. Then use the fast symmetric encryption uh, method, uh, for example, AES for everything else. So the story might look something like this. So you have Alice, uh, they're trying to talk to Bob. And so Alice might, oh, sorry, let me zoom back out. Ah, why is it zooming? Alice might say to Bob, hello there. Now Bob knows that Alice wants to talk to him, uh, but doesn't may not want uh, um, an eavesdropper to hear everything. And so Len, Bob says back, oh, hey, look, here's my public key. So here's my public key, public key. So this allows Alice or anyone else listening in, but it allows Alice to send a message to Bob without people eavesdropping. Because even though Alice can send Bob a message, Alice can't then decrypt that message. So they send this using, uh, so this might be RSA. So a message is sent via RSA uh, encryption. And so it might be like, let's use this secret as the key. Um, so that might be the well, next thing Alice says to Bob. But now what Alice has done is Alice has given Bob a secret. 
And now they shared a secret, and so they can use that secret instead for uh, the remainder of the conversation. And so this is going to be a back and forth conversation, and each one can send messages to each other, and this is locked using, say, AES, using the symmetric encryption. So a different encryption method, and this is the entire conversation. And so you might be wondering, well, why bother with all this? We can just send everything using public key encryption. And yes, you can do that. But that would mean that your online banking might take time, 10 times as long as it currently does because sending messages is quite slow. So you, you might have noticed that whenever you open up secure websites, it tends to be a little bit slower than when you open up non-secure ones. Um, it would be even slower if you were to open them up using only public key encryption and no uh, symmetric encryption. Ah, wait, why can't Eve hear the RSA lock secret? Oh, that's a really good point. Eve can hear the encrypted version of the RSA lock secret, but only Bob can decrypt. That's the point, right? Because even Bob, oh, sorry, Bob re reveals only the public key, but not he, but he keeps to himself his own secret, uh, how he generated the public key. So only he can decrypt and no one else. And so well, that's the point of uh, the public key cryptography, right? Is that you uh, decoupled encryption and decryption. Uh, does that answer your question? Okay, so let's see that, let's see this happen in real life. Um, oh, can you use email as an analogy? Yes, you can. Uh, so basically, a public key is like saying, I'm going to set up a, um, let me see. I'm going to set up a mailbox. So I'm going to set up a mailbox here, and anyone can put a letter into my mailbox, but only I can open it up. And that's the whole point of, I mean, I guess this is an email, this is physical mail. But the basic idea is anyone can send you mail, but only you can read it. And that's the point of public cryptography. Whereas with symmetric encryption, if you're able to put a letter into the lockbox, you're able to open up the lockbox and take it back out. And that's the big difference here. And of course, that's what we did on uh, Monday, is we covered uh, the sort of mathematics behind how you make this happen. And that involved a lot of modular arithmetic, a lot of uh, facts about prime numbers and factoring. And those things all combine together to allow you to do this really clever thing because reversing operations is hard. So let's see a real life example. So I went to the University of Toronto website. So, um, uh, and you, you might've been on that website at one point. And one thing you might notice is that when you're on the University of Toronto website, there is this HTTPS symbol here. So the little, the little S here means secure. So uh, what, what does it, how is it actually securing it? Well. Many of you have probably have seen that and been like, oh, well, the S means secure. But what, what actually does it, is going on behind the scenes? Well, in many browsers, you can actually open it up and look at the details. So for example, if I were to click on the little lockbox, this is in Firefox, it's slightly different than Safari or in Chrome. But in Firefox, you click on the little lockbox and then it says, oh, we have a secure connection, right? And then you can look for more details. So what are more details? Well. If you click that, you end up getting, uh, let's see, you're securely connected to the site. Um, and whether you can, and you can click on more information here. And that'll tell you something about the type of connection that's actually going on. So here, uh, well, this is the security page for Firefox. It has all sorts of details, many of which you probably don't know. But one thing that's important here is if you look here, it says AES. So that is the encryption method that you're using to communicate to the University of Toronto website when you go on there as part of a secure connection. But that's not all. So we have AES, of course, but that's only the symmetric part of the encryption. How did you exchange the key to begin with? Well, if you click here on view certificate, so that is the public key. So that's the actual public key that you're using um, to communicate initially before you exchange the AES key. And if you then open that up, well, you see that there's some certificate. It has lots and lots of information, like all this validation. Is it actually the University of Toronto and all that? But, oh, can I turn off the light, please? Uh, yeah, sure. Yeah. Is that better? OK. So um, you have all this information. But more importantly, if you scroll down, you'll see that there is public key information, this box here. And it has an algorithm, uh, RSA. And it has a key size. So this just means how, how many digits is the, lar are the, is the large number that you're using. How many digits are the prime numbers that you're using to multiply together to get the RSA modulus? Um, and you notice that these are really big numbers. So this is in bits. 
So it's 2048, but in practice, this means that the numbers you're working with are about 200 digits long. So yes, you could write them down, but uh, it would take a while. Um, and then we also have an exponent here, which you notice is 65537. Um, I don't know how good you are at prime numbers now, but it happens to be prime, um, which as you'll see later is helpful for certain uh, app, uh, uses when you're uh, trying to pick the exponent. Any questions about all that? So this is what actually happens on your computer whenever you go to any secure website. Is it's using something like RSA, sometimes LML, but uh, mostly RSA, to send a small secret uh, that they then use to use AES for the actual back and forth communication. And there are lots of technical details I'm skipping here, of course, but this is the basic idea, is you can use these clever properties of mathematics to allow you to communicate securely. So let's give this as a toy example, because that's, of course, I'm pointing out all these like the little details in um, an actual web browser. Uh, wait, why can't I switch slides? Come on, oh, there. So let's give a toy example. So Alice says, hello. So lots of message Alice sends to Bob. And Bob is like, oh, someone wants to talk to me. Well, that means I need to set up a mailbox. I mean, if Bob wants to be talked to, of course. So then what Bob does is Bob generates an RSA modulus and exponent. So in order to do that, Bob says, okay, well, I'll pick two big primes. Um, Bob is not very clever. And so he picks primes that are kind of small. You really need these primes to be really big, but that would take a while to write down. So Bob picks two primes. Uh, P is equal to 29, and let's say Q is equal to 31. And so N is equal to PQ, which is equal to 899. And so that becomes part of his public key. So now Bob, because he generated the prime numbers, he knows that phi of N is equal to 28 times 30, which is equal to 840. And this is quite important. So assuming that Bob generated big prime numbers, only he would know what phi of N was and no one else would. And so like, he, he needs to make sure never to reveal that. If Bob ever reveals that information to another party, they'll be able to read all of his mail. And then Bob also picks an exponent. So let's say Bob picks k is equal to 11. Um, there are subtleties in how you pick your exponent. One of the important things is that the greatest common divisor of your exponent and uh, phi of n have to be equal to 1. Because if they're not relatively prime, then things can go wrong. <clears throat> and so then Bob is like, oh, wait, I should have put all this in blue. Sorry, I meant to put all this in blue. Um, that's all right. So when Bob is like, okay, I'm going to send a public key, 899 and 11, which is his message. So everything I put in boxes here are the things that they're sending out. Um, the things that aren't uh, put in boxes are the things that they're just doing on their own, but they don't tell people. Okay, so Bob generates an RSA, uh, and then Bob, well, sends that public key, which is the blue box here, 899, 11. I was like, anyone who wants to send me a message, just send it to me encrypted to this public key, 899 and 11. And I'll be able to read it, but no one else will. Bob sends the public key, and then Alice is like, okay, so I have a way of sending messages to Bob now, but I want to give him a way of sending messages back quickly. And so maybe Alice is like, okay, well, maybe I want to use Caesar encryption, uh, Caesar cipher, which isn't that strong, but she could use anything she wanted. Um, so, and she chooses a symmetric key. Let's call it A is equal to five. So this would be the Caesar cipher key where it lets you use to shift uh, the letters um, up or down, uh, which is how we did it in the interactive exercise last time. Um, and then what you do, you need to check that the greatest common divisor of five and 899 is equal to one. And this is rel um, relatively straightforward because so, so long as it's not um, one of the prime numbers you chose, of course, the greatest common divisor is going to be equal to one. Um, or sorry, it's not a multiple one of the primes that he shows. You have to be a little bit careful when you're working with really small primes, but you do need a checklist. So the, not every message can be sent, but luckily if you pick big enough primes, you can send basically any message you care about. And then what Alice does is, okay, well, I'm going to encrypt this key using RSA uh, and then send it to Bob. So what do you do? Alice does is five to the 11 mod 899. I'm not going to do this by hand, but this ends up giving you 738 which is Alice's message. <clears throat> and then when Bob receives it, Bob can be like, oh, well, I can decrypt that because I know phi of n. So when you take the 11th root of 738 uh, mod 899, and that turns out to be five. So now notice, 
Alice and Bob both know that A is equal to five, but five was never actually sent uh, in the clear. Uh, it was only sent in this encrypted way. Um, and then once they have that, they can uh, communicate whatever they want. So uh, then they both can communicate using the cipher. So maybe Alice wants to tell Bob, I love mathematics. But maybe Alice doesn't want to reveal that. Maybe this is the secret love of mathematics that Alice has, doesn't want Eve to know. So what she does is she then encrypts it with this uh, key of five uh, using a Caesar cipher. And so what she actually sends is, uh, let me copy this down. R F Y M J R F Y N H X. Hopefully I got that right. So, oh, this is what Alice is sending. And so they can send messages back and forth of that kind. And unless you figure, unless you do a cryptanalysis and break the key, uh, this way uh, Alice and Bob can send messages. And if you have a good encryption algorithm, so the Caesar cipher is kind of weak, but if you have a good encryption algorithm, you can send messages back and forth to your heart's content now, and Eve is none the wiser. How does it equal five? Oh, are you talking about this here? Well, you have to do the computation. Um, so uh, this is the subject of your quiz this week, as well as um, the, your homework assignment for uh, last Friday. Um, basically, we know how to take square roots in, or we know how to take roots in logic arithmetic. And yes, this is long and a little bit painful. You have to find equivalent powers of uh, 738, and then you have to uh, actually compute the powers and use the Euclid's algorithm and all that. But yeah, so this is just the standard method of finding uh, roots in logic arithmetic, which all of you should hopefully know by now because your quizzes are this week. Okay, so having said that, I am now going to have you all do an interactive exercise, which is I'm going to have you all send messages to each other again. Oh, come on, switch. So uh, you'll be in groups of three to five in part one. So there'll be two parts to this. A one, you'll be writing a message, and then the other part, you'll be solving a message. So you're generating an RSA modulus using two using two digit primes. I have a handout here with a list of two digit primes, so uh, you don't need to. Um, I mean, in practice, you'd want bigger primes, but it's going to take forever if you use bigger primes. So let's just use two digit primes. Then you choose an exponent k such that the greatest common divisor of k and five n uh, is equal to one. You choose a Caesar cipher key. Uh, a greater than one with the greatest common divisor of a and n is equal to one. You encrypt the Caesar cipher key by b is congruent to a to the k mod n. You write a short message of 15 to 30 characters. You encrypt the message using a Caesar cipher key. And then you publish the message n, k, b, and the encrypted message to everyone. So basically what you're saying is I have now encrypted the message using this public key. Um, and then anyone who knows the factorization of this public key should be able to read that message. And then in part two, I'm going to have you all try to decrypt each other's messages. When I say publish, I mean just like put on chat um, what your message was, NKB and the encrypted um, Caesar cipher uh, version of it. I have an example on the handout. Um, so in order to decrypt the messages, you need to first, uh, so because these are small primes, you should be able to factor them. And then what you need to do is you need to compute A is congruent to the case root of B mod N. And then you use the Caesar cipher key to decrypt the message. Any questions about all that? So, um, like I said, I want you in groups of three to five. Make sure that you actually are doing all of this. Um, I said this on Monday, but I will repeat it again. This will show up later in this class. There is not, not much later left in this class, so you can imagine what I mean by saying this will show up later in this class. Okay. Uh, oh, having said that, let's go ahead and get to it. So, everyone up. Come down and get a handout. I have more detailed instructions on here in case you're still a little bit iffy on what's going on. I really want you to sort of get a sense for what's going on so that you're not surprised when it shows up again. Uh, and for those of you who are in uh, chat, you can of course uh, get this handout online. It's on the course website and uh, feel free to do it on your own. You, I strongly suggest you do. And then just put your encryptions and decryptions in the chat as well. Uh, let me go hit the lights. Hi everyone, so uh, just a quick, a couple quick announcements. The first is, uh, 
I think uh, if you guys want to take a break, this is probably the right time to do it. I know some people have been going in and out already. Uh, in another, let's say, five minutes or so, I'm actually going to go back and start doing more other a review of other parts of the final, since uh, this isn't the only part of the final that you all need to review. Um, I know not everyone's done decrypting. Also, I realized only belatedly, this is the first time I've tried this exercise, but giving you, allowing you to choose any two digit primes is a bit too big. And some of you end up picking really big numbers and making it really hard to decrypt. So um, I will promise you that the decryption for the one that you'll see later on in this class will be smaller than the ones that you all have been giving each other. Uh, having said that, um, I do suggest that you practice these and some of these are relatively easy to decrypt. Um, or I mean, easier to decrypt uh, later. And I will give I will I will give a worksheet out with a couple more examples of easier to de decrypt ones uh, for you all to practice leading up to the final. Um, okay. So anyway, have a five minute break right now, and then after you come back, then we will uh, discuss uh, finish up this part of lecture as well as uh, discuss reviewing other parts of the final and what you need to know to do well. <clears throat> Okay, so let's go ahead and finish up. I know not everyone's done encrypt decrypting. A lot of that is honestly my fault for letting you choose prime numbers that are too big. Um, like I've been telling various groups, I promise that the prime numbers I will use on similar types of problems in the future will be significantly smaller. So you won't have to deal with um, numbers to the 2000th power, which is honestly just a bit of a pain to do by hand. And you probably won't have enough space to write that all out. Um, let's see. So does anyone have any questions about this before we move on? I will provide a worksheet and I will, I will create a bunch of small messages that are um, easy to uh, solve. So I, I will provide a worksheet with that for uh, you to work on as part of your final prep. Um, and with that, let's go ahead and finish up with this part of lecture. So you all made it to the end. And yes, the material here at the end got quite complicated because Yes, math is hard. Math is magical and it's a lot of fun, but yes, it is hard. And um, there's not much you can do about that, but I hope that you all have enjoyed it and that you guys have a better sense now of what numbers really are. So what, are, what can you do with numbers? Where did math come from? How do people invent all these crazy games, these mind games that we're playing? Um, why did we invent so many numbers and operations as well as how does one think like a mathematician? So in the course of this class, you all have been thinking like mathematicians, um, and um, developing new types of number systems and uh, seeing a little bit here at the very end how even very, very complicated and esoteric math does affect our uh, everyday lives. Though luckily, um, we now have computers to do most of it for us. So, okay, any questions about that? Um, if not, then, uh, so any questions? Comments or anything? Okay, so uh, then just as a note, uh, oh, can you share the encrypted questions post? Ah, uh, so I am actually going to, uh, so in response to the chat question, I am actually going to post, um, I'm going to just create a bunch of encrypted messages. The encrypted messages that you all did were a little bit too big in terms of prime numbers to be easily solvable. So I'm going to create ones that are about as easy to solve as the ones you'll see in like on future assessments. Um, so, but yes, I, I will post uh, like three or four examples of that, uh, which uh, on the worksheet online. 